Moving to our final round of paper speakers, I'd like to welcome Jay Johnson to take the floor. Jay is the former United States Secretary of Homeland Security. He is an accomplished lawyer and also general counsel at the Department of Defense during the first years of Obama administration. Perhaps far more importantly, Jay is an honorary member of the Cambridge Union and recruited all the speakers for this debate. So great thank you for that. Jay, you have the ears of the house. Members of this union, Madam President, my debate colleagues, proposition before this union is Americans should vote blue no matter who. As worded, that is indeed an extraordinary statement. But in America, right now, we live in extraordinary times. I want to take this issue head on. The reality is that a vote for a Republican, any Republican, for a House and Senate seat in the U.S. Congress next Tuesday is a vote to restore the Republican Party to majority control of our Congress. Majority control of our Congress and Mulvaney, Gowdy, and Harmon know this far better than me because they were part of that party, means everything. Majority control means you dictate the agenda in Congress. You dictate the legislative agenda of America or the lack thereof. The reality is that over the last two years, our government has finally begun to turn the corner and make legislative process on things long overdue. A vote to put Republicans back in power of Congress is a vote to return to what Americans have become so tired of. Paralysis over progress, cynicism over hope, walls over compassion. And it is a vote to put Donald J. Trump back in the driver's seat, to dictate to Republicans over the next two years his personal agenda while he runs for president. Some of you may think that divided control of the executive and legislative branches of our government is a good thing a check and balance against extreme and excess. Not true. Divided government is overrated when your partner in the opposing party is not interested in sharing the responsibility of governing. I live with this most of my time in the Obama administration. I'll come back to you. Nothing big in divided government gets done. Nothing big gets done. Even the small stuff gets hard. Compromise is regarded as disloyalty. Extremism is regarded as virtue. In divided government, we can't even agree to pass legislation to do the most basic thing, fund the government. Since 1995, the U.S. government has run out of money and shut down five times. For five days in 1995, with a Democrat in the White House and Republicans in control of Congress, for 21 days in 1995-96, when a Democrat was in the White House and Republicans were in, were in control of Congress. For 16 days in 2013, with a Democrat in the White House and Republicans in control of the House. For 35 days in 2018-2019, with a Republican in the White House and Democrats in control of Congress. And somehow for three days in 2018, when Republicans controlled both the White House and Congress. Over the last two years in the U.S., we've finally begun to make legislative progress on things long overdue, like rebuilding our aging infrastructure, roads, bridges, tunnels, railroads that are falling apart, and lowering prescription drug costs. Pass a modest bill on gun safety. Put Republicans back in control of Congress. All progress on things like reducing carbon emissions in America, stop. All progress at the national level to legislatively restore a women's right to choose, stops. All progress on reducing gun violence in America, stops. Make no mistake, Democrats in America are the party of public safety for one simple reason. We want to get guns off the streets. They do not. We want to prevent a deranged boy from walking into a gun store on his 18th birthday and purchasing an assault weapon to kill innocent men, women, and children. 
An assault weapon is a weapon of war with no legitimate use in private civilian life. No right. No right. Trey Gowdy knows this. No right in the US Constitution is unqualified. Not the freedom of speech, not the freedom of the press, not the freedom of religion, and not the right to keep and bear arms. Then there is the elephant in the room. The Republican Party today is no longer the party of Abraham Lincoln. It is not even the party of Ronald Reagan. It is the party of Donald Trump. The Republican Party once stood for fiscal discipline, family values, lower taxes, law and order, and a strong national defense. In today's Republican Party, what was once an angry fringe has become the center of gravity. According to an NBC poll in late September, 61% of Republicans believe the 2020 election was stolen from Donald Trump, though no court or responsible election official in America has found that. Even more frightening, according to a PRRI poll released in February, 25% of Republicans, one in four, ascribe to the theories of the QAnon group, a group that believes that the government, media, and financial worlds in the U.S. are controlled by a group of Satan-worshipping pedophiles who run a global child sex trafficking operation. The Republican Party is becoming a cult, a cult in which political success and survival means pledging fealty to one person, Donald Trump, a man dangerously ill-suited to hold any public office, a proven liar, a tax cheat, a traitor to his constitutional oath, like likely under investigation in at least three, possibly four jurisdictions in America, who incited and gave aid and comfort to a violent insurrection on the U.S. Capitol. To win Donald Trump's endorsement for a seat in Congress, the Republican candidate must kiss the ring, shed his or her integrity, and embrace Donald Trump's big lie that the 2020 election was stolen. Congresswoman Elise Stefanik is a case in point. Once considered a principled George Bush Republican moderate, Stefanik shed all that endorsed Trump's lies about the 2020 election, and is today the number three ranked Republican in the House. J.D. Vance, once a venture capitalist who in 2016 called Donald Trump reprehensible and once wondered whether Trump might be, quote, America's Hitler, his words, not mine. Today, J.D. Vance is the Trump-endorsed Republican candidate for U.S. Senate from Ohio, but only after apologizing for calling Trump reprehensible. He now stands next to Trump at rallies while Trump takes delight in saying J.D. kisses my ass to get my support. That's a quote. Meanwhile, Republican election officials who have dared stand up to Trump, criticize him, or decline to embrace his lies are one by one systematically driven out. Republican Senator Jeff Flake of Arizona, a vocal critic of Trump's, declined to seek re-election in 2018. Senator Ben Sass, a law and order Republican of Nebraska, who voted to impeach and remove Trump from office, just re-elected in 2020, quitting the Senate in 2022. Congressman Justin Namash, a highly principled libertarian who voted to impeach Trump in 2019, left the Republican Party to become an independent, declined to seek re-election in 2020. Congressman Fred Upton voted to impeach Trump in 2021, censored by the local Republican Party in Michigan, declines to seek re-election in 2022. Republican Congressman John Katko of New York Adam Kinziker of Illinois, Anthony Gonzalez of Ohio, all stood up and voted to impeach Trump in 2021. All declined to seek re-election in 2022. One of the reasons Gonzalez is quitting is concern for the physical safety of his family, a concern brought home last week by the violent attack on the speaker's husband. Arizona, Speaker of the House Rusty Bowers, who refused to cooperate in attempts to overturn the 2020 election results, 
winner of the John F. Kennedy Profile and Courage Award, censored by the local Republican Party and defeated in the Republican primary for a state Senate seat, and Liz Cheney, once the number three ranked Republican in the House, the most notable profile of political courage in America today, putting her oath to the Constitution above political loyalty to Trump, censored by the Republican National Committee and defeated in a Wyoming Republican primary by a vote of more than two to one. Even before he became president, Donald Trump once boasted, quote, I could stand on the middle of Fifth Avenue and shoot somebody and I wouldn't lose any votes. Appalling as that statement is, in today's America, it is more true than untrue. Some of you may be thinking, I'm too negative. I'm alarmist. I need to be more positive. I sound like a Democratic attack ad. But these are the cold, hard facts of the case. I speak the truth. For three years, I was responsible for the homeland security of the United States. To this international audience, I confess I fear for the future of my country. Turns out that the world's most outstanding, most enduring democracy is more fragile than we thought. For the four years Donald Trump was president, our democracy was put under stress and almost broke. Today's Republican Party has been the victim of a hostile takeover by a hostile, vindictive actor who, in all likelihood, will run for president again. And as far as I can see, Donald Trump's only reasons for running again are to reacquire power for the sake of power, exacting revenge on his enemies, and hopefully stay out of jail. Meanwhile, his grip on the neck of the Republican Party is as tight as ever, while all dissent is being squeezed out. A political party plagued by such a cancer is not worthy of power. Just a minute. For now, I'm almost done. For now, it must be consigned to the status of cranky backbench minority. There are many good Americans who are Republicans. I'm looking at two of them. Jane and I know them. In fact, some of them are some of my best friends. But at some point, silence becomes betrayal. My sincere hope for our country is that these patriotic Americans don't give up speak out, fight to take back their party, lead it out of the darkness, and restore it to the party of principled conservatism, of Eisenhower, Ford, Reagan, Bush, and John McCain, that occupies a healthy place in our American democratic system. But for now, vote yes for the proposition. Thank you.